Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the League's Club Leadership Webinar Series, trying to give club leaders the tools that they can use to make their lives easier, make their clubs run smoother, give them more time to spend on their bike, and less time trying to figure stuff out. Uh, if we can give them the knowledge, give you the knowledge, and get you on your bike more, that is our goal. We want everybody to be able to spend more time on their bikes, and we want it to be uh, safe time on bikes. My name is uh, Scott Williams. I'm the Vice President of Engagement for the League of American Bicyclists, focusing on membership, but also on uh, communications, working with donors and corporate sponsors. If you want to be any of those things, I'm the man that you can talk to. You can find me through the League website or replying to one of the registration emails from tonight's webinar. Our panel tonight for the Essentials Group Essentials of Group Riding includes two panelists with really deep roots in the League's Smart Cycling Education Program. Cynthia Rose has been an LCI since 2011 and champions the Smart Cycling Program and Bike Education. She does this as Director of Santa Monica Spoke, as well as on the boards of the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition and the California Bicycle Coalition. She trains pedicab drivers as well as ride leaders for the aforementioned organizations. Preston Tyree is LCI number 518. You've got his trading card. You know that he's been an LCI since 1996 and had some really good seasons uh, in that time. He has served as the league's education director and is working with the league again to update training materials within our smart cycling program. He is a board member for Bike Austin and chairs the education committee. And he's been working on their ride leader training since it started in 2003. Additionally, he has 27 years working with the MS-150 ride, working to keep 13,000 riders each year safe on the road. So he knows a lot about training ride leaders, as does Cynthia. Tonight we're discussing group riding from the top down. So we're talking from an organizational level, how do you select, train, and manage those ride leaders to keep the program running smoothly, everybody happy, and everybody making sure the riders have good experiences. And we'll also talk about what it means to actually be a ride leader on the road when you're out with a group of riders. The experience that we have on tonight's panel works with riders from ages of eight months up to 80 years old. Cynthia and Preston, take it away. We're really anxious to hear what you have to say. Thank you for having me. Go ahead, Cynthia. Um, uh, well, hello all. Um, where are we starting here? We have the agenda. Where do you want to start, Preston? So, Cynthia, how do you select ride leaders for your uh, programs, particularly something like critical mass? For critical mass, which we have not yet talked about, um, is uh, we kind it's kind of like herding kittens. So we try to empower the parents and and teach the parents at the same time that we're uh, that we have a group of general well LCIs that are trained as ride marshals for general ride leading with the extra um, gentleness I think that's required for for working with children and also delicately training their parents uh, to be good examples. Sometimes they're the ones that we need to work on the most. The kids will fall right into line. That, so you want me to keep... Well, particularly when you're working with kids, I was going to jump over to uh, talk about some of the more uh, longer distance rides, some of the group rides where we, we put 30 to 50 riders out for anywhere up to 100 miles. and. Uh, in Bike Austin, we have a pretty rigorous program, and uh, you can't be a, a a ride leader. There is some self-selection, but you pretty much have to be an experienced cyclist. We're not, we don't let people who are brand new go out and uh, take this on. Uh, and one of the things we recommend is people have CPR and uh, automatic electronic defibrillator training uh, every two years. So there are some criteria that we have uh, when we talk about ride because we're going to give them a lot of responsibility. I would agree that we do, we do more or less, I think you you are ahead of us in Austin in the, in the, um, the just the curriculum that you have that's pretty much set where we're, we work in, in small 
pods, I would say, and for us in Santa Monica, we're definitely, we do the same sort of, it, it, the, the, you must be a good ride leader in LA, I mean a good uh, cyclist or, or, or an experienced cyclist. And for the, and it's the same uh, is true for all of our ride leaders. So I think that for critical mass in particular, that it kind of, it's either parents or people that have work well with children beyond those regular ride marshal um, uh, responsibilities and, and um, uh, things that we need them to have. Okay. Just to keep everybody up to date, we're going to spend some time talking about critical mass a little bit later, but I want you to be, be aware that what we're talking about tonight is, what, as Scott said, everything from like eight months to 80 years old. So this is... This is not the the mammals, the what is it, male males in lycra or whatever it is. Uh, this is yeah, what is it, males? This is <laughs> yeah, this is everybody. Yes. So let's talk we about. Have, have, go ahead. Go ahead. We have we have ride leaders even for critical mass that are almost fall into the eight to eighty. We have some really great um, youth. That are coming up, that have responsibilities and kind of lead that put them in leadership roles. Obviously, not the responsibility of a ride leader, but um, and also we have some people that are, I would say, up in that 70 mile, I mean 70 mile, 70 uh, year range that are also um, ride leaders and great leaders, um, very nurturing leaders for both our our, our long distance rides and our critical mass rides. So let me talk a little bit about the training we do here in Austin uh, before we let somebody actually lead a ride. Because again, we're putting a lot of responsibility on these ride leaders. We certainly go through all the laws, the state and local laws, what they mean. Uh, we use the uh, LEAD Smart Cycling Program. Uh, a lot of this is pulled right out of TS 101. Uh, one of our LCIs, Eileen Schaubert, uh, started this uh, in 2011 I've worked with her since then, but she's also been out in Santa Monica and worked with Cynthia, so we both had a benefit of Eileen's work. Um, beyond the state and local laws, we also talk about what are the club procedures. We do require helmets for all our rides, um, and I'm going to do a caveat on that. We require a helmet for all of our rides, what I would think of as a the road rides where people are going to be using road bikes, they're going to be going at high speeds. When we go to social rides, we don't necessarily require helmets, which can be fairly controversial, but uh, we'll talk about that some more. And then our training is all of our rides are posted on the website. We, we post somewhere around 12 rides a week. So all of those rides are posted on the website, so anybody can go to the website, find the ride that they like, and go on. Uh, the training also um, involves group riding skills, a league program is called Group Riding Skills, and that's a, that is really great if you uh, haven't had a chance to do that or found an LCI that does that, uh, work with them and get, the, get that curriculum and do that because it, it really will take a novice rider and make them very comfortable riding in a pack. Uh, we're going to talk about the types of rides we lead in a little bit, but uh, I wanted to throw it back to Cynthia and say, you know, what's your procedure uh, on posting rides? Do you all post them on the website, or how do you get them out? Again, I'm kind of speaking from my, my Santa Monica spoke group and also what we do in Los Angeles. So, yeah, we, yes, we post our rides. We as a group don't have regular rides. We have groups that we work with and organizations that we work with that do have regular rides. We also have organizations that we work with that had regular ride marshal training. And I guess we'll talk a little bit later on how we are kind of uh, to bring that underneath the umbrella of uh, a collaboration with LACBC and the Los Angeles County Bike Coalition so that we have a standardized, more standardized like you have in Austin where all the ride marshals, ride leaders have the same, can have the same expectations if we get, if we recruit a ride leader from clear from another organization in my organization. Yeah, did that answer your question or did I? I think so and it's, you know, recognize that geographically we're different. They all tend to be shoulder to shoulder. Your cities tend to be shoulder to shoulder. Where in, Austin, in Texas we have five population centers and the rest of it is kind of dusty and dry. So uh, 
the fact that we're doing this in Austin, we do it actually do it for about 11 county region, but then it's three miles to, I mean, three hours to Houston. So recognize that we don't have cities all jammed in together like I would assume you do in uh, California. Yeah, we have we have 88 localities and 89 with the county in just our in our region. So it has been a challenge, and many many groups that have either been working but are now definitely working very collaboratively to try to really focus on on a standardized education with the leadership of Mero and the and the California Office of Traffic Safety we have we have some funding that we're doing some classes and we can talk more about that later we did those in 2013 and we're doing them 2014 and we're doing them again this year great are we ready and to those talk are the, are we ready to talk about different kinds of rides sure let me run down to what we, the way we categorize rides. We have most of our rides are what we call hosted rides. That means there is a person who is responsible. That is a ride leader. They have trained. They're allowed to post on our website because they've had to train uh, their members <coughs> by Austin. Um, and these are all no drop rides. Uh, so that puts a lot of pressure on the ride leader and hopefully they will also have other people with them because the ride leader should be riding and setting the pace and they should have other people with them. We'll talk about sweeps later. We also have what we call self-paced rides. Uh, these are rides that are traditionally we've had them for years and somebody doesn't want to necessarily host them and want to start them and just have everybody ride at their own pace. And so these are not no drive rides. These are rides that are uh, people go out and just enjoy the ride. The hosted rides, by the way, are all ranked. They, uh, we have a ranking of no hills of the one, very hilly at four, and we have a ranking for speed from E, which is a family ride, to double A, which is the big horses going out and running here 25 to 30 <laughs> rides. So, we are very careful to make sure that we hold those paces uh, on those rides that are advertised, and that's one of the jobs of the leader. We also have what we call event rides. We have fundraising rides, we have three a year, but we also have social rides at least once a month where people get together typically at a, a location with adult beverages and ride somewhere between six and ten miles and end up at another location with adult beverages. And we typically will get anywhere from 50 or 70 riders for those once a month. And so that's a little bit different operation. Most of those people are uh, not on road bikes. They're on city bikes, they're on BMX, they're on whatever. And we have not, we have taken the attitude that we are not going to force the issue of helmets on those bikes. So I bring that up because it's, it becomes, I think, very controversial in a club when you start talking about no helmets. Um, our insurance company, and we work with uh, McKay Insurance, uh, our insurance company has been comfortable with that. They've said they're fine. The uh, family rides, and we, do, we don't do kids and mass. I expect we will be soon, but we do family rides. We have family fun rides uh, once, about four times a year, where we invite families and everybody come out. And that's it's actually one of our biggest uh, recruitment. Thing, is to get families involved and get the kids involved. So it's uh, also where we find a lot of learn to ride potential. We do a lot of classes on learn to ride. So what kind of rides have you got in your area, Cynthia? So that what I would say first of all is I, I worked with Eileen, as you said, and we we talked about in depth about how we could um, categorize our rides the way you have in Austin. And with so many groups doing different doing rides in the LA County area, we have not reached that point yet because of obviously we can't control how other people post their rides. For us at in Santa Monica Spoke and LACBC, most of our rides are run by the organization, regardless of whether they're encouragement rides or uh, fundraising rides or family rides. We do sometimes help publicize rides that are run by partner organizations or individuals, but for the most part, um, 
they are run by the organization, so we have our document that we fall back on that we kind of, that the ride marshals or the organizers know they need to either publicize any hills. We don't have as many hills as you do, um, or, or maybe you don't, but um, that everything on the ride is, is publicized in, as far as the difficulty. We don't have those categories like you have. Um, we also, we have our Sunday fun day rides. We have rides that are run by Metro through another group. So a lot of them are, um, they're, they're more social rides than uh, really roadie rides or long distance rides. We have our one fundraising ride per year for the Los Angeles County Bike Coalition, which is our LA River ride, which has been going on for 16 years. Uh, as far as helmets, which is uh, definitely an issue that is is a hot topic issue. We recently changed our uh, our helmet requirements to suggested but not required, or recommended but highly recommended but not required. Uh, and that is partly because of an equity issue. We find that we're going into a lot of areas that maybe are lower income areas at times, or or people who don't have uh, the money to buy helmets, and we don't want to exclude them from our rides. So we we made the decision to eliminate helmet required from our ride marshal and our ride um, our rides. We do also, and I know you do this in Austin. We uh, we have some free and low cost helmets, and those are really we don't have funding for that on a county wide basis, except for our this current um, uh, funding cycle for our smart cycling program, helmets, free helmets and lights are included, but on an ongoing basis we do not have funding for free uh, helmets, but we are looking for that and we do those on a, on a group by group and an organization by organization basis. So we really fall back on a, on a pretty comprehensive document that our ride leaders need to look at first and then um, we train them based on, well not based on, but after they've read and, and understand that and uh, and pass them that way. So I guess that's it. Okay, in your uh, social rides, I assume you do some that extend into the evening. What do you do about lights for your riders? Lights and, and the law, legal requirements are always required. Uh, front lights and rear reflectors are required, but again, we highly recommend uh, rear lights. In California, I don't know about in Austin, but only rear reflectors are required. We definitely um, encourage rear lights as well. And we have some, we do have some of those that we give out at rides. For instance, the City of Lights program for that the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition did, we went out in uh, areas all over the county and gave away free lights. So we have a, a source for lights that we can try to have with us at any of our events if they run into the evening. Yeah, that's been one of our equity issues is the whole lighting issue. So the front light is required, uh, fairly simple LED and then a red reflector in the back which you, you can pick those up pretty much anywhere. So. Yeah, that's same here in California. Okay. Um, and the, do you want me uh, to go into the critical mass ride separately, or? Why don't we go into the critical mass? We got some, a picture up of at least one critical mass ride, and I noticed there's a, there's a father with a uh, scooter and a child with a uh, with uh, training wheels. So tell me about critical mass, the way you run it. Critical mass is, is we feel very lucky in Santa Monica. It's actually it's work it's coordinated with the local advocacy group us, and also much supported, greatly supported by the Safe Routes to School funding and the City of Santa Monica. So we are able to do some really fun and creative rides with you know free pizza and uh, and they're all no cost. So we have our regular group of core group of LCIs which have been trained to do the critical mass rides uh, and we stay locally. They're generally from anywhere from one and a half miles to we have a long one that's a garden ride where we take a, a stop halfway through and we visit one of our community gardens and get a tour and the kids get to play with the dirt and the plants and talk about sustainability and that one's about three and a half or almost four miles. So they're pretty short. 
uh, but we have um, like activities beforehand, helmet decorating, and then we generally have an activity after after we get back. The rides run about 30 to 40 minutes, not because of the distance, obviously, but because of our little riders. We don't uh, we don't not allow training wheels. I should say. we don't um, eliminate kids with training wheels or scooters, although we have a shorter route that takes them back to our starting point um, sooner. So they, we have a shorter route that cuts those kids that drop to the back and takes them back to our starting point. And we generally get back around the same time. So it's, it's again, it's empowering parents and getting the parents to behave and realize that they're, that, you know, if, if they're riding the wrong way on the street to catch up, that they need to think that their kids are going to emulate that. So getting that message out delicately to the new people that have not been on the ride is uh, something that we do at the beginning in a very encouraging atmosphere. But um, we've had a, just a blast. We've been going, this is about a year and a half now. And we're getting ready for Critical Massive that is a, a pirate scene. <laughs> is, that, uh, is that a picture of you, Cynthia Rose? It is a picture of me. Yeah. Okay. And I have that. On the front, on the front, my grandson is behind me, and my youngest grandson is in the trailer behind that. And when he's not in there, I use my extra cycle as a SAG mobile. So we've had, you know, we've loaded extra bikes on there, and obviously it is a no rider left behind ride. And that purple little animal on the front, that Snarfle, he's our he's our mascot. I particularly like the polka dots here. Yeah, that was my that was I was a ladybug that day, and we actually had Maddie Carlson with us on that ride. She was visiting Los Angeles the weekend we had this ride, and she and her boys joined us on this critical mass ride. It was just so much fun. I look at the it's how could you not have fun? It's yeah. crazy. This, uh, for those who don't know, critical mass was started in Eugene, Oregon, by Shane McRoads, who's also an LCI and a uh, lead coach, and uh, it is spreading across the country pretty quickly. If you haven't uh, looked at it, if you haven't done any community, go to Critical Mass, I think it's .org, and take a look at it. CriticalMass.org. Yes. Yeah, take a look at it and uh, see, see, it's just a fantastic ride, and I've done, I've done it with Shane and Eugene, and I've done it in other places, and it's uh, a real blast. The following, the next slide is some more pictures from uh, Cynthia Rose, and I think this one is particularly good. Uh, yeah. We have a dinosaur in the, the lead here. Is this a critical mass or just a group ride? This is a critical mass ride, and I that was a Halloween uh, costume ride. And I will say that on the ride before the the picture before that, the panorama, um, we had uh, about 140 people total on that ride, parents and children if you can imagine. And this one right here, yeah, we, so we have a theme for every ride, and this one was um, Halloween, and we had some of the greatest costumes. They were just adorable. So, Cynthia, if you've got this thing going, you've got, I assume you have a leader. Do you have sweeps? Do you have floats? Do you have other uh, volunteers who are part of a ride marshal program? What? The LCIs run... Our group of LCIs are the marshals. We also have, um, when I took my LCI training, it was actually hosted by and several of our city staff in the city of Santa Monica took the LCI training at the same time. So we have, currently we have, we had four, but we currently have three LCIs that are on our city staff. So they're actually there helping lead these rides as well. We always have several sweeps. We always I'm generally the leader to set the pace. Well, I, let's take it back. I am. I have always been the leader to set the pace. But we have a separate um, group that is we acknowledge will be the, the that will falls off the back, and that group will have a sep a, a new leader and a sweep, and then we also have a sweep for the for the 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 main ride. So we realize that our rides always break up into two distinct, much slower groups. And so we have two ride leaders and two sweeps that are already connected and designated at the beginning of the ride. 
Okay, the next two shots. As well as. The next two as shots. well as you know about. Sorry to interrupt you. We we generally try to have um, at least well, depending on the size of the RSVPs, we have a designated number of of uh, ride leaders in comparison to the total of um, of kids that we have RSVP for the rides. In what ratio do you run or try to run? We try to run about 1 in 10, 1 in 15, knowing that we have parents that are also going to help us do that as well. So um, for that ride that we had 150 people, we did not expect that many people at that ride. Uh, but we had at least um, we had 10 to 12 ride leaders for that, including both our two leaders and our, and our two sweep. We also engage our pedicab riders to help us run sweep on the rides. All right. These next two pictures I don't think are critical mass, but they are group rides in your area. Can you talk about them a little bit? Sure. These, this is, as you can see, we still even have kids that come to our, uh, our other rides. This is a, a ride that we had around um, the expo train that's about to open, and it is actually coordinated with our uh, lo one of our local clubs, which is the uh, Velo Club Lagrange. And they support this by, uh, by, by having this ride at their uh, crit race. So two years ago we started this and it's a ride that and, uh, it's really uh, touring of the west side and the history of trains in Los Angeles and the new trains that are arriving. So both of these uh, next slides, both this slide and the next one, are both of that expo ride. Okay, so we've got a lot of a lot of photographs of urban rides here, uh, and that may be what you do. Uh, Austin, That's, we don't have a lot of rural like okay. you do. Yeah, we we get out in the country pretty fast, uh, and we we actually have a train here that stops in downtown. You can put your bike on the train and end up 30 miles out in the country and get off the train and go ride. It's beautiful. So we do a lot of rural riding. So. I want the people who are listening to this who are visualizing the rural rides. We really do that. We, uh, we it's not all urban riding like this, but don't put the urban riding aside. This is where you get your members. This is where you get your families. This is the future of riding, I think. I would definitely agree, and we have we do have some extended rides that go out of town. We have to use Amtrak more or less than the train, although we do use light rail. But those are um, we don't have we really don't have the time to do those as much as we would really love to. We I think we run uh, something in the order of uh, out of our 12 rides a week we probably probably half of them are rural rides. Uh, so one of the things we do to support our ride leaders is we have created a mentor program where somebody says I want to be a ride leader but I've never done this before what do I do? And we can match them up with somebody who's been around a while and has done this and, and leads rides. So that they get a chance not only to go out and work with them, but also in learning how to put it up on the website and do all that kind of stuff. For those of you who are technically minded, we use City CRM for setting our rides and everything else. It's a software package that uh, is available and it's very cheap, if not free. And uh, so just be aware that that's what we're doing. It if you are interested in setting your rides up. The other thing we do is we put uh, experienced ride leaders out just to watch and support uh, ride leaders on the ride. So we do actually do reviews of ride leaders every so often just to make sure we're all on the same page and we're following the same program. So we do we do support our ride leaders. We don't just train ride leaders and set them loose and say good luck. Uh, we're there, there for support. And this is this program that we've got is uh, was started, like I said, by Eileen Schaubert, uh, but it has now take, been taken over by the by Bike Austin, and is uh, it, it really does support our members. So what happens during the ride? So what do you tell your ride leaders uh, about emergencies, Cynthia? Call nine one one first, then try to get anybody else on the ride. Uh, any of the per people on your list, uh, I, I, we, they have their basic uh, 
list of phone numbers. We have, they should have first aid training. They should have, they are supposed to have a first aid kit. If they don't have enough, then obviously they call the, uh, the ride coordinator. They have a designated phone number. But uh, if it's a serious incident, it's always call 911 first and then get in touch with the ride coordinator to go on from there. All right, so let's look at it in order. The pre-ride, uh, we do a sign-in. Uh, our members sign a waiver when they sign, become a member. So when non-members show up at rides, we haven't actually do a waiver. Uh, we've got an interesting program going now with under 18 where a parent can sign a waiver, but the parent doesn't have to stay with the under 18 if the ride leader agrees. We've had the situation where the under 18 is stronger than the parent. And the other team will leave the parent in dust. And so we need to make sure that we're covered. And we've talked with our insurance program, and they are very comfortable with us taking that on if the parent gives permission. So we actually do that now. Uh, ride leaders uh, say in their description of the ride if they will take on under 18s. So we've got some really strong under 18s coming along, probably will become racers at some point. And we've had to deal with that. The other thing we do on sign-in is make sure we have an emergency contact uh, with a, a telephone number uh, and who is it? Is it the son? Is it the spouse? Whatever. So we have all that. And then we do a fairly extensive pre-ride briefing. And it's not left to memory. It's each ride leader gets a page that says, here's what you say. And we, we're pretty, pretty adamant that that's what they're going to say so that we make sure everything is covered. A pre-ride briefing includes things like, oh, we've got construction on the road at this point, or because of the, the heavy rains we had this last week, there's probably gravel in some of the curves, some of the turns. Uh, we've tried to sweep as much as we can, but you've got to be careful. You've got to take responsibility for that. So we, we go through that process uh, in the pre-ride. This is particularly true when we do these uh, longer rural rides, these out, these out of town rides. Uh, in town, it's not quite as critical because you're all in the middle. Uh, Cynthia, have y'all got a pre-ride process you go through? Uh, it's very, I think, pretty much similar to yours. Everybody signs. We don't have the the uh, member waiver so pre-signed, so everyone signs a waiver. Uh, if they're under 18, they need to be with their parent, and it's pretty flexible, similar to the way you said. Emergency contact must be on, and it's at the same. It's on the same uh, waiver form where the emergency contact is. We have a listing of very similar to what you said. We have a very extensive list on what is gone through for the pre-ride. It talks about the route, anything that we need to look at. Um, you know what to expect, how to call obstacles. We identify people who have never been in a group ride, uh, so that we can maybe give them a little bit of extra counseling on, you know, overlapping wheels or anything like that. But um, all the that's generally run by whoever is coordinating the ride. But all the ride leaders have been exposed to or have that list. Great. The the under eighteen thing is become very. Interesting right now, we've got some really strong young riders, and so it's uh, it's embarrassing when the, the parent can't keep up with the young rider. And so we've, we've worked around that, and we've actually set a policy for it. During the ride... That's great. We what, actually have the same sort of a pro where we have um, children that are, I mean, quite young people, and it's it's their parents are there because they have to be there, but they really... They they're going to get smoked by their kids, and we have the same sort of uh, the same sort of situation happening here. It's great to see that, and it's great to see their parents out supporting them. Yeah. Okay. One of the, on these what we call hosted rides, where we say this is this ride's going to go out at 16 miles an hour, this ride's going to go out at 12 miles an hour, this ride's going to average eight miles an hour. One of the primary jobs of the leader of the ride leader is to set the pace, to hold the pace. And we say in the pre-ride briefing, if you go off the front, you are on your own. You better take a map with you because you're not going to have anybody to tell you where to go. So we do <coughs> set that pace and hold it to that pace that's advertised. 
Uh, we also try to work with uh, sweeps to stay with the last rider. Somebody, an experienced rider that will stay with the last rider, will help them through. Uh, that is a very thankless job sometimes, but it's a necessary job because sometimes those riders will be well behind the main time. We also try to do, you know, and I say may have, we have what we call floats. These are people who move up and down. They're usually very strong riders. So they can ride ahead to like the next turn and then come back and talk to people as they're coming forward saying, hey, there's a left turn up here. Be careful you're crossing the road, that kind of thing. So uh, if you float on a 20-mile ride, you may get 40 miles in if you're really good at it. So, um, that's one of the primary jobs of the leader on these hosted rides is to set the pace. Uh, like you, we call 911. We have an emergency contact. One of the things that we finally figured out is somehow we've got to transport that bicycle back. If somebody gets picked up by a, an EMT, we've got to figure a way to get the bicycle back. So that's one of the things that we work on. Anytime we have a crash, we will call back to uh, somebody with a car and try and get them out to transport the bike so the bike doesn't get left somewhere. I guess we're about, we, again, we're very similar. Off the front, uh, you're on your own, uh, and it's not encouraged. If you want to be on the ride when you're off the front, you're, that you're leaving the ride, pretty much. Uh, most of our rides, again, are not as out in the middle, out in, in, they're more rural, and they're more encouragement type social rides, so, or getting to Ciclovia or something like that. We, uh, and the pace is generally set by as the tempo of the group percolates to the surface. So the majority of the group will set the pace. We always have a sweep, so that's identified before we start. This is the leader. This is your sweep. Uh, if somebody starts falling off the back, they'll actually call one of our floats. We always have floats, unless it's a, a smaller, less formal ride, in which case we'd have to work it out. Uh, and the, the sweep would stay with them, but the, sw the sweep for if somebody starts falling behind on one of the rides with floats, they would call a float back. The float would probably stay with that person if they need to be picked up, and they would continue to be the sweep on the ride. Uh, and I already talked about 911. We haven't really had the problem of transporting a bicycle. We've had several people that have had to leave rides because of either mechanical issues, well, mechanical issues, and we just make sure that we have the information to get them on the bus and get them back to the starting point. We have not yet had to transport anybody with that's, a bicycle. That's a good thing. Cross your fingers. Yes. Knock on wood. Yeah. So the, the long ride is pretty straightforward generally. Uh, when we do uh, the, the events where we're doing uh, fundraising, we tend to have a lot more support uh, we have SAG vehicles and all this stuff. Some of our regular rides, we will have SAG vehicles, but uh, not normally. Uh, we may have uh, rest stops, uh, but it's typically at a convenience store somewhere. There'll be a, a car there with some with water and some other things, but it'll be a convenience store so people can go in and use the, the facilities and do that kind of stuff. So typically on our regular hosted ride, we we really don't spend a lot of time on the rest stops and the SAG, but uh, certainly when we go to the fundraising, we pamper our riders. Our rest stops will be anywhere from 8 to, 10, 8 to 12 miles apart, uh, so they uh, try to pamper our riders. On the we, a, our, our large uh, uh, fundraising ride is pretty much the same thing. We have, we have lots and lots of, of uh, people running SAG and, and on the course. The course is actually a loop for our largest fundraiser, so we just have to go back and forth on that and they can have designated areas, but we have a lot of rest stops, we have SAG vehicles, and, and a lot of uh, on-road on support, either mechanical, or medical, and etc. You know, one of the things I've been watching is the question box. We're not getting any questions. I wonder if there's anybody out there that's listening to us. Certainly <laughs> We're all talking to each other, sitting around. I, I, we do have some, Preston, some questions, Preston. I can toss them to you now. I'm not sure whether they would show up in your box. Uh, yeah, they're not 
in my mailbox, so maybe you're getting them and we're not. Yeah, I, I, I've got a few. We can uh, take them now before you move on, or we can finish the presentation and then get to them all at once, whichever you prefer. Okay, well, we're, we're pretty close to the end, so why don't we just go ahead and finish up and we can answer questions. It looks like to me we've got uh, 18 minutes left or so. If that's okay with uh, Cynthia, we can go on. Sure. If I'll just tell Sounds great. I'll just tell people again, we're taking questions in writing, as we just alluded to. Uh, if you don't see a dashboard with a panel to type your question in, you might have a little gray lozenge with a red arrow button on it. Push that red arrow button, and it should expand. You should see a panel for questions, and you can type your question in there. We have a few, and we'll try to get to all of them before we wrap up. Great. So we'll go ahead and wrap this up pretty quickly. At post -trial, one of the things that we always do is we have people initial when they get in uh, so that we always know who's out there, who's still out there. Uh, that can be a real pain for the uh, people who are initially them in and uh, watching because people may be very slow coming in. But we feel it's important that we know that some people have gotten in and uh, we tell them ahead of time, if you don't check in, if you don't do initial, we're going to call your emergency contact and your mom may not like it. We call her and ask where you are. Uh, we, we get pretty good compliance. People come in and sign in. The other thing that we ask our ride leaders to do is to uh, typically, you know, we used to say fax, but now it's it's copy and email. The sign in and all the waivers. Uh, our get sent in the staff and get filed. Uh, they're filed electronically, so we do have a record of who is on the ride who signed in. Uh, and who signed waivers. So all of that is documented so that down the road if somebody comes back and says, oh, well, you know, I crashed and everything else. And I want to talk about waivers a little bit. You really don't want to go into court in a liability case without a waiver. But don't depend on the waiver to protect you. Uh, the waivers have to meet some fairly rigorous standards. Uh, and I've been at least one case uh, as an expert witness where the waivers were thrown out. So the defense of saying, well, he signed a waiver, got thrown out uh, by the judge. So, but you don't want to go into court without a waiver, so get the waiver signed. If you're running rides, get the waiver signed. And if people say, well, I don't want to sign the waiver, then you can't let them ride. It's that simple. Cynthia, what do you think? I am completely in agreement with you. You must sign the waiver or you cannot participate on the ride. If it's a public street, so if you're following us, we can't stop you, but you are not a part of the ride and they are told that absolutely without a doubt. We keep all our waivers on file. Uh, we don't have, I like the idea of that check-in and for some rides I can see that working for us, but for the most part, well, exclusively we always have a sweep on our rides, so nobody's gotten behind that sweep. If they go off, then we don't know that, but we count when we start and we count as people come in. That's that's our met method of, of ticking them off uh, when they come in instead of the initial return. But waivers can't can't stress enough how strongly waivers are. And I'm, I'm assuming you have a waiver that you could share. I know that our waiver has definitely been looked at by legal and we have it hopefully has all the things that we need. We don't obviously want that thrown out of court. We haven't had to use that, but I have also heard of, of things where uh, uh, situations where the waivers were not um, uh, where the wa waivers either saved the ride uh, organizers or they were thrown out. So it's not a situation I want to be in. Well, the, the easiest way to get a good waiver is to go to your insurance company and ask them for what they would like to see because they're the professional exactly. and they are going to be the ones who stand between you and the suit and so get them to give you the waiver that they want to see, that they will defend and that's the simplest And I have way. a question for you. Um, we have a waiver that has the legalese and it has multiple signers on the same waiver. Do you use something like that or do you have a one page everyone signs uh, with the legalese on each page? We, we actually have both, and an attorney that I've talked to are comfortable with either one. Uh, good. But if, good to hear. if you put that as a page and a whole document and everything that they're reading, they just sign as part of the page. That could get thrown out because it is not 
clear that they are giving up rights when they sign that. And so it's it's a it's an interesting legal thing. Uh, so it really needs to be a single page that says waiver on the top. You are giving up rights. You know you have a right to contact an attorney before you sign this. All that good stuff. Uh, but multiple signatures on the same page, as long as it's below the waiver, it cannot be above the waiver. It has to be below. Yes. Uh, and we also have a checkbox that says we acknowledge that we are signing yeah. this waiver. That one gets a little bit dicier, particularly if you do it electronically, but it's been accepted in court, by the way, so it's, it probably works. I, I, am we not, have not, I am not an attorney. Anything I say has no strength in court. <laughs> right. uh, in court on we it. have not gotten to uh, electronic waivers yet, so I, we hope to get to that because I just don't want to waste all the paper, but uh, we know that we have to protect our leaders and our organization, so we haven't quite gotten to that far yet. Until we're until we're yeah. confident that we're going to be safe. On to the next thing, and look, there we go. Time for questions. Okay, mm -hmm. terrific. I have some for you. Um, uh, we had a couple of people asking you, Preston, to go back and talk about the software that you're using in terms of of organizing your rides and ride leaders and, and so forth. You mentioned Civi CRM, I think. Was there more to it? Uh, do you want to talk a little bit quickly about how you're using that? Well, Civi CRM is really a uh, client management program. Uh, it's what it was originally designed for, but it works pretty well uh, to post a ride. And the neat thing about it is you can clone a ride. So if I post a ride and I want to post it every month, all I have to do is clone it and change the name or change the date. So it's very powerful from that standpoint. And if somebody knows City CRM, it's really easy to work with. We also have a, one of our guys who likes Drupal, but I have not never learned how to deal with Drupal, so I don't use that. But City CRM is uh, the simplest, and it's uh, you can set it up so you go in and say. Okay, I'm going to do a ride, and I'm going to do it to this location. And so the location pops up every time, so you don't have to type that in. Or you may have three or four locations, and you choose. You have a drop-down menu, and you choose. So it's, it can be very flexible, but it is like most software. It is rigid. You have to do what it expects you to do. So you need to spend some time getting used to it, just as you would with any software. Um, but we have found it to be very, very powerful, and we can also register people and take their money uh, through that. Uh, we use uh, PayPal. We just register people through PayPal, and they pay for PayPal, and we it just comes straight into our account. Um, so uh, we found it useful. What you find, you need to find somebody who knows how to use City CRM. We've got a guy who's been working with us for about six years, and he's moved away. He's not in Austin anymore, but we just call him and say, hey, can you help? And he is so good, he comes back in 20 minutes and says, okay, that's fixed. Now what do you want? So you need to find one of them. I have a request uh, here for your pre-ride checklist that you mentioned, Preston. Everybody probably wants the name of your Civi CRM guy now, too. Uh, but <laughs> Well, we settle for the pre-ride checklist. Is that something you can give to me, and I can post it when I post the recording of the webinar, so that uh, people can see that? Uh, Scott, you are, you know by now how I work. If you will send me an email and say I want that pre-ride pre-ride briefing and pre-ride checklist, I will be glad to send it to you and share it with everybody. Uh, but my brain does not work well unless you send me an email. <laughs> okay. All right. So you're you're fully web integrated at this point. Send you an email and it gets your brain working. That's uh, that's good stuff. Um, I would say that I know I have not used CRM, but uh, LACBC has been using Nation Builder for a similar type of um, of coordinating all of their rides and, and events. So I don't know if, if if you have Nation Builder already, you would have to have it already. But that could be something that could be useful for anybody who has that would be able to use that. Yeah, Nation Builder looked like one of the others that we would have used uh, if we didn't use the city CRM. 
it's, it's a great resource for just coordinating everything from Rise. It creates a whole little uh, uh, nation, <laughs> uh, so you 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 can control everything within that. I have not really used it. We just use postings, the old-fashioned way, and then um, RSVPs. So, so here's a question about how you handle group rides for new adult riders, and certainly would apply to new kids too. I mean, how much detail do you go into on smart cycling skills, hand signals, uh, communication while while riding together, uh, how to pass, uh, where you should be in the road if there's not, you know, uh, you know, should you be in a bike lane? If there, where should you be on the road? Uh, how do you communicate that stuff to new riders who aren't used to group riding? Cynthia? It's really, all that is covered in our pre-ride talk. So it's, it's you know, where you should, how and when you should pass, uh, singling up, um, hand signals, calling out obstacles, uh, all of that is covered in, uh, you know, what car back, car up means. All of that is covered in in um, in our pre-ride talk, and that's again why we ask people for, at the beginning: Is there anyone here who has either never ridden on this far or never ridden in a group before? So that we maybe even em emphasize even more some of the things that they may not be used to. Is that is that pre-ride talk something you could share with us uh, along with the checklist? Resources for the people I'd here. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. That's what I was going to say. Is it, it depends. On our double A rides, we do very little of that because uh, these are, you know, the horses that go out and run hard. Uh, by the time we get into a C or a D ride, we do a lot of it. And the E ride is primarily designed to get new people involved. And so we spend a lot of time, probably 20 minutes, going over a lot of the information. Uh, what are the laws? Uh, why why are we riding in the middle of the road? Uh, those kind of things. So uh, it depends on the, the group, and we know the group because we posted and said this is an E rider, this is a D rider, this is a C rider. So it's uh, uh, yeah, it varies depending on what what ride you're leading. Okay. Uh, we, go, we even do the ABC yes. quick check. Yeah. We even do the ABC quick check. Yeah. Okay, um, I have a couple of related questions. Um, the first question is, you, do you try to keep the whole group together? Otherwise, stragglers will get caught at red lights and get even further behind, or they'll just bike through the red light to try to keep up because they think they're entitled to because it's a group ride. Um, so that's one question, and another question which I think is sort of related or would at least point to an approach for this. Do you break large groups into smaller groups. Uh, our club has 11 weekly rides, mostly rural and fast. As group size has grown from 40 to 60, even 100 riders, we've broken rides into groups of ideally less than 20, easier to control and better share the road image to motorists. But we still have some groups of 80, 60 to 80 who want to ride together as a pack. You want to go first, Preston? Yeah, we have those. Uh, we have the same situation. Uh, a group of 20 works much better, but it means you've got to have more leaders. Uh, you've got to have more trained people to, to do that. Uh, I get, personally, and I am, you know, I'm a vehicle cyclist from way back and one of the strong proponents for vehicle cycling. But when we start putting 80, 80 cyclists in a pack on the road, uh, I think we begin to hurt our um, the vision of who we are and what we're doing out there, and so I would I would certainly like to see those pack broken up. But yeah, I can understand where they ride, but they have got to be cognizant of the fact that we're riding in public and that, that we are sharing the road with everybody else, and we have got to obey the rules. You know, 80 people going through a stop sign without stopping. I'm sorry, but I can't accept that. Uh, certainly not running red lights. Uh, and uh, I, I fight for cyclists' rights to the roads, and it really irritates me when the cyclists do things like just blow red lights and blow stop signs and ride on the sidewalks and all that kind of stuff. It really makes my job that much harder. So just you know, keep that in mind. 
I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, we, I find that for most of our rides, they kind of self break up. You're going to have a group that's a little bit faster, and that's why we, for bigger, for larger rides, we have multiple leaders. So we let them know at the beginning they will not be left behind. If there is a major turn or or anything like that, we generally wait and bunch up again unless it's a huge ride, but again, as soon as we start off, I think that it always gets broken up because they're told at the beginning, we do not run red lights, we do not run stop signs. Uh, you can go through in small groups, but you certainly cannot go through in a, in a trail of 80 or 40 or even 30. You have to be cognizant of the other uh, users on the road. So in that sense, I think that ours generally break up. If I had to break them up, I would definitely not hesitate to that if it made sense, hesitate to do that, but uh, we have not needed to do that. We find that they really just generally tend to break up on their own. There's always a faster group, always kind of a mid group, and there's always the slow group. I'm not sure we answered the question that was asked, uh, Scott. Uh, if you've got a group of 80, you just, okay, but you've got to, you know, the law says two abreast. So you run a double pace line, uh, but you also break it up at stop signs. If you come to a stop sign, what we feel comfortable with is a group as big as a tractor trailer going through, but not the whole eight. Um, and our police are fairly comfortable with that. If we do that and break and let people cross and then go again, um, that seems to work. And uh, with a group of 80, you may have some stragglers, uh, but they probably ought to break off into a separate group. I would agree. Terrific. Um, question here, uh, when you had theme rides, do you have police escorts? And I, I would guess that applies certainly to some of the critical mass rides. How are you handling you know, all those riders on the road? Do you involve uh, police? Or even when, when does a ride get large enough or uh, special enough to involve police escort? We do, we, ha we do not have police escorts. We have n not been required to by our police department. On our, one of our first rides, because they were nervous about it, there was a particular crossing that they did show up at and uh, actually corked for us. Uh, that, that was the only time, and they've never done it again. We do have another ride that uh, runs through the city that in a small city of eight square miles, uh, it's about 400 riders. So it's or has been as large as 400 riders. We have let the police know that we were doing the ride and that we would be following traffic laws, and they have never offered to or required us to have an escort, and we have never solicited that. I know in LA there was a time where we had police escorts for the critical mass rides, and that was um, that is that is no longer happening that I am aware of. And I can't really speak to that directly because I wasn't involved, but I know I know they did do police escorts for a while for the critical mass for the critical mass rides that were you know 700 and plus people. We're we're out of time, I think, but let me make one comment. Uh, tend to use the term "court," uh, and that typically means that we're going to block intersections and let the whole mass go at one time. And if the police are doing that, that's wonderful. You've got riders doing that. That is illegal, and those riders are taking on a liability they really don't want to take on. Uh, so, be I careful. completely agree. Wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. The uh, we use police uh, when we have special. We have a a, uh, a twinkle twinkle ride at Christmas, and uh, enough riders go out that we typically have motorcycles front and in, front and back, uh, and they love it because we're going to go view all the lights. Uh, we also will have uh, police when we are crossing major intersections, if we're having big rides, uh, organized rides and we're crossing major intersections, we will ask police to come and help us get through those and court those intersections for us. And they seem to work pretty well. We have to pay them, typically, uh, but for the safety of our riders, uh, we do it. Okay, Cynthia and Preston, I have two more questions which I think are, are pretty straightforward, not too open-ended. 
uh, if we could uh, take those two more questions and then uh, we'll wrap it up for the evening. You got time for, for a couple more, Cynthia? Certainly. Preston? Let's do it. Okay, this one I think relates to something you were saying about process, Preston, but uh, it uh, probably pertains to both of you. It's regarding the emergency info from the waivers. How does the ride leader access this if needed? Is there a coordinator who keeps the hard copy, or does the ride leader have it? And uh, assuming you know that the rider involved in a crash could be unconscious, how do they even know the rider's name in a worst case scenario? One of the things we do is that typically we have somebody staying at the start, and they will have the hard copy, but the ride leaders will take pictures with their, their smartphones, so they actually have the documents, uh, and they can do it. And the answer is, hopefully you've got a friend who knows who that person is. If you don't, then, you know, you call 911 and hope for the best. All right, and this side... Uh, uh, ride... Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Cynthia, go on. That's okay. I, I generally carry them with me for our large fundraising rides. They're held at the at the at the home base location, but they have uh, wristbands that correspond to their um, information. Yeah, if you've got ride members, that really makes a big difference. From certainly from HIPAA standpoint, you don't have to call somebody's name over the air. But typically, we push people to carry some sort of ID, so we can find a, a wallet, or we can find a road ID, or whatever. So it's not like we're completely at a loss. Agreed. Okay, and then this next one, I, uh, I, I'm i sorry, Cynthia, I keep cutting you off. No, I, I was just saying, yeah, next one, there, let's go. Okay, all right, This I hope this is an easy one. I hope, I hope you both know the answer to this one. Aside from a local bicycle coalition, are there any membership-based organizations that a local cycling group hosting paid or free rides can join or needs to join? Oh, gee, let me see. American Bicycle. American Bicycle. Um, yes, Definitely. that's... That's the answer I was looking for. Uh, we do have an insurance program uh, that you are eligible to participate in, that it is an, es uh, an especially good deal for small organizations uh, because it is a group policy. And uh, for small and fledgling organizations, I think the rates are unbeatable. They are competitive, competitive rates for larger organizations. You can post your rides and information about your organization on our website so that people can find you. We host great programs with great panelists like these, um, and we do it with uh, your membership dollars. So I hope your organization is a league member or will become a league member soon. And Cynthia, you can probably think of, I don't know, statewide coalition? Cal California Bicycle Coalition. What's the value to uh, a... Well, for us, for us, it's really, and, and, and for me, it's really been about the vertical integration of information and sharing and collaboration. So that's why it's been so important for me as a local leader to be connected at the county level and also at the state level and through the league and the Alliance of Biking and Walking at the national level. Nothing happens in a bubble, and if we all work together, we're all going to make this better for everyone who walks and bikes. Excellent. <laughs> Preston, you had thoughts? Uh, Bike Texas in Texas, uh, most, I think there's, last I heard there was 37, 38 uh, state organizations, something that are, and you really ought to get involved. Uh, they can make a difference at the state legislature and can, can make our life simpler. Just remember, we're all in this together, and we need to work to make sure we're all on the same page. Terrific. Well, absolutely. And did I neglect to say? Did I neglect to even say the organizations of so Santa Monica Spoke, Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition, and California Bike Coalition, and all of their affiliates, including the league. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you very much, Cynthia Preston. We appreciate your time and your experience and everything that you've shared with us this evening. 
Uh, thank you to everyone who attended the webinar. We've got pledges from Cynthia and Preston to get their pre-ride safety materials, and we'll post that with the webinar on the LEAD website within a couple of days. Uh, we'll probably also put it on the blog and get it on Facebook so that you get some notice where to see it. Um, if you don't know where to find it, send me an email. Uh, thank you very much, and good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Scott and Preston, great talking with you. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Preston.